Hello everybody and welcome to a new video on the Mirror Lessons channel and in this episode I'm going to talk about the Fujifilm X-T4 and a specific genre which is birds in flight. I'm going to show you all the relevant camera settings, the performance of the camera and which settings gave me the best results. Just to let you know, there is a written version, a text version of this video on our website mirrorlesscomposer.com so if you want to bookmark that link to check it out later, I'll leave the link in the cards or in the description below. Also, this video is going to be a bit long because it's a tutorial, so if you wanted to jump to specific sections, you can use the chapters at the bottom or uh, the table of contents in the description. All right, let's get started. And first of all, here's the Fujifilm X-T4, which is one of the most interesting APC cameras on the market. And if you're not familiar with the camera and its specs, I can show you right here. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into all of these specs, but a few notes about some of them. So first of all, we have phase detection autofocus and the X-T4 has the latest AF algorithm, so the latest software available from Fujifilm, which in theory makes the camera the best Fuji camera when it comes to autofocus performance. Uh, then we have the uh, drive speed with a maximum of 30 frames per second, and I'll talk about those in depth later on in the video. And then we have five axis stabilization. The X-T4 is the second Fujifilm camera to have in-body image stabilization, but for birds in flight, you don't really need it because you're going to use a fast shadow speed and you can disable the internal stabilization as well as the optical stabilization on the lens without affecting the quality. Right, so let's begin with some general settings, uh, things about image quality, viewfinder and a few other things that I set up first on the X-T4. Concerning image quality, these are the two main settings I use. I always choose RAW for the file type and leave white balance to auto. I find Fujifilm cameras to work well in auto mode and I can easily change the white balance in post if I need to. Concerning the RAW file, you will find three compression levels in the menu, which is uncompressed, lossless compressed and compressed. Compressed should give you the smaller file size, which is useful when shooting in continuous mode because the buffer clears more quickly. However, in my tests, lossless and compressed RAW gave me roughly the same file size, so it's better to stick with lossless to preserve all the quality. One important thing to keep in mind uh, with birds in flight and why it is important to shoot RAW is because you don't always get an optimal exposure in the sequence. Uh, birds can fly really fast from an area in the shades to an area in the direct, with direct sunlight, and the camera might not be able to change the exposure quickly enough so you're gonna end up with a few images that are underexposed or overexposed, and by using a raw file, you can easily recover one stop, two stops of exposure uh, in Lightroom or, even, or any photo editing software uh, very easily. Whereas with JPEGs, you're gonna be much more limited. Concerning the exposure settings, use manual aperture and shutter speed. One thousand of a second is the minimum for the shutter speed to freeze the movement of the bird, but I recommend going faster than that if you can, because when tracking a bird, you don't have just the movement of the body, but also the flapping of the wings. And some birds can flap their wings really fast, and you will need a fast shutter speed to have more details on the entire animal. I always use auto ISO with a maximum of 6400 or even 12800 if the light is really bad. For example, if it's raining or there are very dark clouds. 12,800 is the maximum ISO value where I find image quality acceptable. Then we have metering, which is called photometry in the X-T4. There are four settings available when it comes to metering, and I always tend to use multi for one specific reason. If the bird is flying against the sunlight, the lower part of its body and wings are in the shades. If you choose a small metering mode such as spot, the camera will most likely think that the subject is too dark and make your image brighter, overexposing the background or even the head of the bird. With multi, the camera determines the exposure by analyzing different areas of the frame, so even if most of the bird's body is dark, the overall exposure on the entire frame should be correct. There are some interesting settings uh, for the electronic viewfinder, and I'm going to start with a personal preference. That preference is to disable the exposure preview. The reason for this is that tracking wild animals often happens in challenging light conditions, where the subject can go from a lighter area to a darker area in a matter of seconds. If you leave the exposure preview enabled, the brightness in DVF will go up and down all the time, and I find this to be annoying. With exposure preview off, the viewfinder keeps an optimal brightness regardless of the light situation. If you don't like this idea because you prefer to see your exposure in real time, you can activate the natural light view. It disables the effect of film simulation modes, 
white balance and other settings giving you less contrast but keeps the live exposure on. Then we have the power management setting with performance and here you want to choose boost which does two things. It ensures that the autofocus is working at its maximum capacity and improves the quality of the display. There are three options for boost. Choose EVF frame rate priority which increases the frame rate to 100 frames per second or 100Hz giving you a better and smoother live view when composing. Right, so these are the fastest continuous shooting speeds available with the X-T4. Note that slower speeds such as 10 frames per second and lower are also available. Here we need to talk about mechanical versus electronic shutter and how it affects what you're seeing in the viewfinder. With the mechanical shutter you have the physical curtains going up and down and covering and covering the sensor between each frame, as you can see here. If I switch to the electronic shutter, the mechanical curtains are not moving anymore and if I take another burst, you can see this time there's no mechanical curtains going up and down. Then we have two speed modes that you can select with the drive dial CH where you can reach 15 frames per second or 20 frames per second with the electronic shadow and CL where you get a maximum 8 frames per second. Let's see exactly what happens in the viewfinder with all these settings. With the mechanical shutter and the CH drive mode, the camera doesn't show you a live view of your scene in DVF or LCD screen. Instead, you see the images that have just been recorded. You don't see what is happening, but what just happened. There are no blackouts and you see an uninterrupted sequence, but it's not very smooth because it's working at 15 frames per second, which is the continuous shooting speed you selected in the menu. This can make tracking a fast bird a bit more challenging because, for example, when you see in DVF that the animal is changing direction, it actually already did. With the CL mode and the mechanical shutter, you have live view, so what you see is what is happening, but there are blackouts caused by the mechanical curtains going up and down in front of the sensor, so you don't have a clean view of the action and these blackouts can be very annoying. With the electronic shutter, the camera offers the best of both worlds. There is live view and no blackouts because the camera doesn't use the mechanical curtains and it has enough power to maintain live view while recording the images. You can also notice how the frame rate remains high when you start to take a picture, giving you a smoother view. This offers a better chance to track the bird more precisely, even when it suddenly changes direction. If you paid attention to my previous slide, you saw that I mentioned a 1.25 times sensor crop when choosing the faster speed of 30 frames per second, and dx 4 mentioned this when choosing the setting. And this is how the crop looks like and you get a 16 megapixel photo rather than 26 megapixel. Now we could argue that unless you need that 30 frames per second speed, you're better off using the 20 frames per second electronic shadow using the full area of the sensor and then crop in post-production whatever you need to crop. And normally I would tend to agree with you. However, there is one reason why the 1.25 times crop with the electronic shadow can be useful. It can affect the performance in a positive way, and I'll show you this later on in the video when we talk about the performance of the camera. Another thing with the electronic shadow is that you can get distortion in your image, and that is known as rolling shutter effect. This happens because when the camera is taking a picture, it can't read all the pixels at the same time, but it reads the pixel from top to bottom. And if you're panning really quickly with the camera, the camera can't read all the pixels fast enough to maintain straight lines in your image. And I can show you a quick example right here. Here's an example with one of the regular tests I do with the camera's review. You can see how the horizon is perfectly level, but the street lamp is distorted rather than being straight. Now with birds, uh, distortion is a bit more difficult to see because um, you know birds don't have a simple geometrical shape with just you know, vertical lines, you know, their, their shape, their design is much more complex. And to be honest, it is much less noticeable. And I can show you some more examples once again. If we look at the first image taken with the electronic shadow, you might think that the feathers at the tip of the wings are too distorted. But if you look at the second image taken with the mechanical shadow, you see that it happens there as well. We could argue that the feathers are more banded on the electronic shadow version, but it's not a drastic difference. One last thing. Inside the menu you will find a function called pre-shot yes and this is another thing you can do with electronic shutter. Basically the camera starts to load pictures in the buffer memory when the shutter release button is half pressed. When you fully press the shutter button this picture will be saved into the memory card. 
This is great to capture unexpected moments like a bird flying off a tree. So there are important settings for the X-T4 when it comes to autofocus performance and some of them can really influence the performance in a negative or positive way, so let's have a look at all of them. First we have the focus area and there are three focus modes to choose from. Single point, zone and white tracking. Don't worry about all because all just allows you to switch between all of them using the rear command dial of the camera. The one I recommend is zone. There are three grids to choose from, 3x3, 5x5 and 7x7, and 7x7 is my favorite. The 7x7 grid gives me a large area to work with, even if I don't keep the bird exactly at the center of the frame. The camera will choose the appropriate points automatically. White tracking starts with a single area at the center, but then once the subject is locked, the camera tracks it no matter its position in the frame and uses all the 117 focus points available on the entire sensor. However, the accuracy of white tracking really depends on what type of background you have behind your subject. Let's see a first example. Here the bird is up in the sky, and after an initial hesitation, the camera locks on the subject and then keeps switching focus points to maintain focus on the red kite, and in this situation, it works well. In this second example, however, the camera is getting confused too easily and switches from the bird to something else in the background too quickly. You can see here that the X-T4 has locked on the bird in the first frames. But then a few frames later the focus points are on the background and the bird is out of focus. Next we have the AFC custom settings, which allows you to configure the sensitivity of the autofocus with different presets or manual parameters. There are five presets designed for different situations. For example, set 1 is multipurpose, whereas set 2 prevents the camera from refocusing when momentary obstacles go in and out of the frame, for example a tree. Set 6 can be configured manually. In my experience, there are two good options here. You can choose set 4, which is designed for suddenly appearing subjects. Fujifilm shows you a skier going downhill, but it works with birds too because the preset makes the autofocus as reactive and as fast as possible, and this is what you want. The second option is to go with set 6 and manually configure the autofocus yourself. There are three settings to work on. Tracking sensitivity defines how long the camera waits before changing focus. With 0, it changes as quickly as possible, whereas with 4, it waits a longer time before changing focus. When tracking birds, you want it to be as quick as possible, so choose 0. Then we have speed tracking sensitivity, which determines how the camera responds to changes of speed inside your composition. At 0, you're saying to the camera that your subject is steady with a constant speed. At 2, you're saying that your subject changes speed constantly, and with the kites, I choose 2. Finally, we have zone area switching, which works with the zone focus mode only. With front, the camera will prioritize the subject that is the closest to the camera. With auto, it will prioritize the center of the frame, then switch to other focus points around if necessary. With center, the central area of the frame is given priority at all times. For birds, I choose auto. So these settings work well, uh, in my opinion, for birds in flight, but by making the autofocus as reactive as possible, sometimes the camera can react a bit too fast uh, on something going on, or might switch too quickly from one subject to the other. And I can show you an example right here. So here I was tracking the bird at the center, but on the next frame the camera decided to focus on the kite at the bottom of the image rather than the one at the center. Fortunately, this doesn't happen too often. Now, if you know in advance that the bird you're going to photograph is slower, or you know he has his movements are predictable, then in that case you probably don't need the fastest settings the camera has to offer, you can tune down the autofocus performance a little bit. Next we have release and focus priority. With focus priority, the camera theoretically will take a photo only if the picture is in focus. With release priority, the camera will capture the shots regardless of the image being in focus or not. So choosing between focus and release priority can be a bit tricky sometimes. In my experience, you know, I review cameras, so I'm interested in knowing what's the best keeper rate, uh, what's the highest amount of images in focus that a camera can deliver. And I know by choosing focus priority, the camera will make that extra effort to ensure that all the images it's capturing are in focus. So, I mean, theoretically, that's how it should work. 
With release priority, you can end up with more images out of focus in a single sequence. And I can show you an example right here. Here I have a sequence of 36 photos and only the first two are in focus. So the XT4 didn't recover focus quickly enough with release priority enabled. One thing to know about focus priority, however, is that the continuous tuning speed you selected in the camera can be lower than the number you selected. So for example, if you choose 15 frames per second with the mechanical shutter and focus priority, the camera might actually um, shoot at 10 frames per second or 8 frames per second. And this happens because basically the camera is checking focus between each frame. And if uh, the autofocus is not keeping up fast enough, uh, then the camera is gonna delay the next shot to correct focus. So it's really up to the autofocus performance if it can keep up the with the fast speed or not. So choosing one or the other really depending on the situation you find yourself in. In my case, I test uh, cameras for birds in flight in the same location, which is a red kite feeding station, and there are many of them in Wales. And there are sometimes 300 kites, and they feed them every day. And the show can last anything from half an hour to even two hours. And the action is always the same, the kites flying, then they dive down, grab a piece of meat, and they do this over and over again. So even if the camera with focus priority is not shooting at the maximum speed, the chances for me to get good shots out of that day is high. However, if you are in the wild and you've been waiting for a bird all day to appear, you know you have only one opportunity to capture the shot, then in that case, you probably want the camera to take as many images as possible, and you're just gonna hope that the autofocus can keep up. There can also be some cases where you can pre-focus in advance because you know where the, the bird is gonna land or you're waiting for a bird to take off. And in that case, release, release priority makes more sense. And just to clarify, release priority doesn't mean that you're always gonna get out of focus shots in your sequence. And I can show you another sequence right here. So this time I have 25 photos in this sequence taken with release priority. Green means in focus, orange means slightly soft, and red means out of focus. And you can see that this time I got more images in focus. So really the thing to remember with release priority is that it is more unpredictable and the keeper rate can decrease by 10 to 15%, sometimes even more. There are other settings in the autofocus manual focus section on the menu, but I wouldn't worry about this. The only thing I recommend is to turn off face and eye detection and then turn off pre-AF. Another thing I like to do is to use the back button focus. So instead of focusing with the shutter release button, I use one of the buttons at the rear. Uh, the default one is the AF on button, which is this one here, but I prefer to use the AL button here. And what's nice about this is that if you press just once, the camera will focus once, almost like being in single AF mode. And if you press and hold, then the camera will focus continuously. So it's a bit like having single AF and continuous AF with one button without the need to change focus mode. Right, so we're seeing all the settings that are important to configure for Birds in Flight and the X-T4. So now let's see how the camera performs. And the best way to introduce this is to look at some images. This is the lens I used the first day. It's the 100-400mm 4.5 5.6, a lens I know very well and use multiple times with different Fuji APC bodies. It has a fast AF motor, excellent sharpness, and you have the versatility of the zoom. So let me explain how I evaluate a focus accuracy once I have all the images. So when I'm home, I'm going, I'm putting all the images I've took uh, into Lightroom, and then I divide them in different folders depending on the settings I've used. So for example, if I have 
200 images taken with the mechanical shutter at 15 frames per second, white tracking and focus priority, these photos will go in one folder and then have 150 frames taken with um, the electronic shutter, zone AF and release priority and that will go to a second folder. So basically I have one folder for each settings combination. And then I start to analyze the images and I'm basically looking for three things. So perfect focus, perfect sharpness, slightly soft images and out of focus images. From there, I calculate two percentages. One where only the perfectly sharp shots are counted and another where the slightly soft results are included. The reason for the second percentage and the inclusion of slightly soft images is that I noticed over the years that with many mirrorless cams, you do get quite a lot of images that look perfectly sharp when you first see them, but as soon as you zoom in to check sharpness, they don't look perfect. You can still perceive all the details on the bird, so the image is not completely rubbish, but at the same time, you can tell it's not as sharp as other images that you may have on your hard drive. So by including the second percentage and these slightly soft images, I can do a better analysis of the camera's performance and get a better idea of how the performance really is. Right, now let's see some scores and results. So the best overall score I got with the X-T4 is 67% if I only include perfectly sharp images or 90% if also includes slightly soft images. And this is the best score uh, regardless of the position of the bird, so when the position was against the sky or against a busy background. The worst overall score was 51% and 61%. And the reason I got a lower score is because I use Y tracking. Now let's go a bit more in depth. The best score I got when the bird was against a busy background was 66% and 82%, so overall not that different from the previous score. Then the worst score I got with a busy background, that's really lower than all the other ones. It's 28% or 33%, and once again, the reason for this is white tracking. Now, when the bird was against a plain sky, I got 71% and 86%, and very interesting, the setting that gave me this score is white tracking. So white tracking doesn't work well when the bird is against a busy background, but when it is against the sky, it's actually the best setting to use. And the worst score I got with the birds against the background, um, then it's 54%, 82%, and by using the settings you can see on the screen. So a few extra comments on all these results. Uh, so number one, uh, I've noticed that with most of my setting combination, the hit rate, the keeper rate was always a bit higher when the bird was against the sky rather than a busy background. When it is in the sky, if you have dark clouds behind him, sometimes the camera can struggle to acquire focus initially, so it can take a few more sec seconds to lock on the subject. And if the bird is really far, so it's very small in the frame, whether it's in the sky or against a busy background, then the keeper rate can decrease by 10 or 15% if not more. So when the bird is really small in the frame, the camera will struggle more to acquire focus. Another pleasant surprise was the battery life. So at the end of the day, with more than 40,000 files on the SD cards, the battery icon was showing two bars out of five. So pretty good performance there. This is a new battery that Fujifilm designed specifically for the X-T4, and it definitely showed better performance than the old one. So while I was taking picture with the 100-400mm at that uh, red kite feeding station, I noticed that I didn't need to use the um, longest focal length, so 400mm. 300mm or 200mm was more than enough. And just a quick reminder about focal length and equivalence. So 200mm on APC equals to 300mm on full frame cameras in terms of angle of view. Likewise, 300 mm is the same as 450 mm and 400 mm equals to 600 mm. So because 200 mm or 300 mm were enough to take good pictures of the kites, I decided to go back there a second time and to rent a lens that I wanted to test for a while but I never had the chance before. And the best way to introduce the lens is to show you some more images.
And here is the XF 200mm f2 that I rented for the weekend. It is the most expensive and largest lens Fujifilm has ever built for the X system and comes with a 1.4x teleconverter and the lens costs $6,000. And this is the teleconverter. Uh, there is a 2.0x teleconverter you can use but it has been designed for a 28 aperture and not an f2 aperture. Fujifilm says that the image quality can decrease a little but I didn't have the opportunity to verify this myself. So one of the reasons I was curious to test the 200mm lens, it was not just a question of sharpness or to see the bokeh and the subject separation between the bird and the background, but I was also curious to see if the AF motor was faster and if the lens could improve the keep rate and the results I showed you before. So let's have a look at these results. So with the 200mm I concentrated on images with the kites flying close to the land, so with a busy background. And this is the second best score I got, 70% and 89%, and please take a note of the setting highlighted in yellow. Then this is the highest score I got with 200mm, 79% and 94%, and this is the highest score I got with any Fujifilm camera and lens to date when photographing red kites. And as you have noticed, it's the 1.25x crop mode with the electronic shadow that gave me the best result. Having a better keeper rate with the 1.25 crop is not news to me. It is the same conclusion I had when I tested the X-T3 two years ago. What is curious, however, is that it didn't make a difference when using the X-T4 and 100-400mm. I don't know if it's just a coincidence or if it highlights a bit of inconsistency in the camera's performance. Another interesting finding is that this time, release priority was a bit better than focus priority. The X-T4 is quite an interesting camera for video. It can shoot 4K up to 60 frames per second, and in Full HD you can go up to 240 frames per second, so even in terms of slow motion it's quite an interesting camera to use. And the autofocus is quite fast even when you're recording 4K video. In video mode there are only two focus areas available, multi and area, and I choose multi. You also have the AFC custom setting, but there are no presets and just two parameters. Tracking sensitivity, which makes the camera quicker or slower to react just like for still photography. I chose zero, which is the quickest. And AF speed, which makes the AF slower or faster in going from one focus point to the other. I chose five, which is the fastest. All right, so let's see some of the footage I recorded with X-T4. Okay, so we reached the conclusion of this video and there are two extra things I want to mention. First of all, the camera design. The X-T4 lacks a prominent grip at the front, as you can see, and with the 100-400mm or the 200mm, you're going to feel the need for one. Holding the camera becomes tiring after a while. And this is a short clip uh, where I'm, I'm using the X-T4 and the big 200mm and you can see how big this lens is in comparison to the camera. There is a vertical battery grip that might improve the ergonomics a little, but I have not tested it. Another interesting thing to mention is how the X-T4 compares to other cameras since Birds in Flight is one of my regular autofocus tests. So here is the best score I got with the X-T4, 79% and 94%. Then we have the best score I got with its predecessor, the X-T3, two years ago, when you can see that there is not a huge difference between the two Fuji cameras. And then we have the Sony A9 series, which is the best mirrorless cameras I've tested so far for birds in flight. The X-T4 is not as good, 
but it's now closer to the performance of a Sony A6400 or D7 Mark III. The main difference is that on the Sony cameras there are less settings to worry about and only one configuration to use really. If you're curious to know more about all the mirrorless cams I've tested for birds in flight, you will find on our website mirrorlesscomparison.com a best of list with all the rankings, all the score I got with all the cameras from the best to the worst. And I'll link the article in the cards and in the description below so if you wanted to check that out. As a reminder, there is a written version of this video on our website, so if you want to check that out. And on that article, there is also a little bonus. It's a quick comparison between the 200mm prime lens and the 100-400mm to to zoom at 200mm. And I know that it's a bit of a silly comparison because one lens is three times more expensive than the others, and one is a prime, the other is a zoom. But if you're just curious to see what's the difference in terms of sharpness, you can check the article. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you have any questions or any topics that I haven't covered in this video and just want to ask some question about, feel free to leave a comment down below and I'll respond as soon as possible. Thank you again for watching and see you soon. Bye bye.